let's give it up for the hummingbird. One of the most classic, iconic, and easily one of the most recognizable guitars in the world. First introduced to us in 1960 by Gibson as its first square-shouldered dreadnought. Now, let's pause there for a second and just say welcome to another episode of an ongoing series that we're calling What's Your Favorite Guitar? And it's going to be a combination between guitar stories, demos, reviews, histories, of course, a lot of playing, discussions about old and new songs, and all in the name of attempting to answer that off-sided question. But Ed, which one is your favorite? Which I get asked a lot. And normally, I usually answer it pretty clumsily. So in the last few weeks, I've really started to contemplate that question and the various answers that stem from it. I don't know if we're ever going to come up with a solid conclusion about that question, but I do know that we have a great opportunity to talk about guitars and talk about music. And if you're like me, there's nothing more moving, inspiring, passion-inducing, and generally enjoyable than guitars and music. And I'll tell you something, so cool. I took a break today, just taking a walk. And of course, here in New York City, everybody just throws their trash out on the sidewalk in front of their apartment. And what I happened to spot was this beat up old empty box of clearly somebody's very first guitar. I mean, look at this thing, right? It, it's obviously half guitar and, and half toy, but I'll tell you, it really sort of brought everything home for me when I saw that on the sidewalk. You know, that could be a four-year-old, it could be a 10-year-old, someone who, for whatever reason, really wanted a guitar and got their first guitar, maybe for their birthday or something, who knows. And in 10, 15 years, this person could be the, you know, next biggest rock star in the world. You know, we just don't know. But talking about the hummingbird and being a kid, I remember as a kid, the first time that I saw a hummingbird and a dove and a J200 on TV or in magazines. Those three guitars, all by Gibson, um, really spoke to me. They just, they lit rock and roll fire inside of me. And um, as a disclaimer, as you guys know, I'm a Gibson-sponsored artist. In fact, this, this is a 1995 Epiphone Hummingbird, which my Gibson rep gave me back in 20, probably 2010, 2011. And, um, you know, I absolutely love the Hummingbird. Gibson or Epiphone, I'll take it. Um, let's, let's talk about that just for a second, just to allay any confusion that there is out there about that. Because normally we would be saying this episode is about the Gibson Hummingbird, right? It would just come right out of our mouth. Um, but this episode is actually about a 1995 Epiphone Hummingbird. Now, in the early 20th century, for decades, Gibson and Epiphone, Epiphone were two guitar companies 
just duking it out. Both of them had their headquarters in Manhattan. Uh, they had a shop with a studio where oftentimes the greatest players of the day would come in, see the newest guitar models, usually we're talking arch top guitars at this point. Um, arch top guitar meaning something like that bad boy up there, that's a K parlor guitar from the 1940s. That's an example of an arch top guitar. And that's what all the coolest cats played. And at the time, Gibson and Epiphone were really in a heated battle in terms of who made the coolest and the best guitars. One of the great players from back then was this guy named Les Paul, right? He also happened to work at Epiphone. And as most people know, he just wanted people in the back of the rooms to be able to hear him. So he kept trying to increase the amplification on his arch top guitars. Remember, these are acoustic guitars at the time. And he took his idea to Epiphone first they declined it. And remember, we had electric guitars. They were electric acoustic guitars. But what he wanted to do was build an electric solid body guitar. And you got to look this up if you haven't seen it before. Um, his first model, uh, the log, where he just takes a solid chunk of pine wood. Then he takes an Epiphone guitar cuts it in half, and he puts those two halves on either side of this solid chunk of pine wood, and then he puts strings on it and some homemade pickups, and this is his idea, an electrified solid body guitar. Hey, brilliant idea, right? Epiphone says no. He goes to Gibson. Gibson says no. Now, years and years pass, believe it or not, this is in 1941. Leo Fender comes out with an electrified solid body guitar. Now, of course, all those words, what we're really just saying is the electric guitar. That's what we call it. But back then, he was pitching it as an electrified solid body guitar. And once Fender comes out with theirs, both Epiphone and Gibson realize that they've got a problem on their hands. People are starting to move away from arch top guitars and parlor guitars. Rock and roll revolution is going to happen in 1951. It's 10 years later. Gibson, not Epiphone, is the first to call Les Paul back and say, hey, remember those designs you had for an electrified solid body guitar? And of course, the rest is history. The Les Paul is born. And in fact, it was the Les Paul Custom Black Beauty that was born from this. And it was by Gibson, not by Epiphone. To be good mates and to play fair in the 50s, Gibson buys Epiphone. So Gibson owns Epiphone. Hence, why we can have a hummingbird by Epiphone when you think to yourself, hey, isn't that a Gibson guitar? And the same could be said for the Dove or the J200. A lot of the guitars that we think of, some people don't even realize. Some people think they are Epiphone guitars. Some people think they're Gibsons and don't even know that Epiphone also makes them. Now, to be fair to Epiphone, I love Epiphone, so I have no problem being fair to Gibson or Epiphone. Um, but just to treat them with the respect that they deserve, they do release a lot of different takes of classic Gibson guitars like this one. But they also are very well known and loved for their own guitars guitars that Gibson doesn't make. For example, right above me, you're gonna see the Epiphone Sheridan. 
That is one of my favorite guitars. That's what you call um, a semi-hollow body. Very heavy, a lot of feedback, a lot of resonance. It's like an electric guitar and an acoustic guitar. Johnny Lee Hooker loved that guitar, played it exclusively. Um, that's exclusive to Epiphone. Directly behind me, I'm covering it up. It's one of my favorite guitars, and if you look at it, you'll know it's one of my favorite guitars, of course, because there are thousands of videos and pictures. That's one of the guitars that I take to the stage almost all the time. Love that guitar, love everything about it. And as you guys know, that was um, one of John Lennon's favorite guitars as well, the Epiphone Casino. And right here is the Excellente, one of the rarest and most beloved and sought after guitars in the world. And Epiphone, they only made it for a few years. Um, people absolutely loved it. You're gonna get a chance to hear it. Um, just this year, Epiphone has just really started to kick butt in guitar circles right now. Everybody's talking about Epiphone. They've got this new master built series of guitars and their, their quality has just gone through the roof and their creativity. Really, really exciting. So that's what the hummingbird sounds like. That's the sound, right? Something that's great about the hummingbird is that it's very easy to play. A lot of people ask, well, Gibson comes out with the hummingbird in 60, 61, and it's the second most expensive guitar, right? Second only to the J200, which is their jumbo. And then a year or two later, they come out with the dove, which is another bird guitar, right? And a lot of people get those two guitars mixed up. The Hummingbird versus the Dove. What's the difference? Why did they even do it? Well, basically, the Hummingbird has a smaller scale length, okay? That's just the measurement from here to here. And it also has um, a smaller nut width, meaning it's easier to play there's less space between the strings. Now, of course, that depends on how big your hands are. I actually like bigger necks with larger nut widths um, myself. They're easier to play for me. But plenty of people love this because it offers them the power and the size of a dreadnought body with a slimmer neck, right? And a shorter scale length. Now, a shorter scale length means there's less tension on the strings. That's what number two is. This is solid spruce top, solid mahogany back and sides. You see, the dove is solid spruce top with solid maple back and sides. That's going to give you a brighter sound definitely a brighter sound. It's not going to give you the warmth or the bass response that you're going to get from the mahogany out of the hummingbird. And also it has a longer scale length. So the string tension is going to be a little bit stronger. So there are definite differences between the hummingbird and the dove. Although I think that we should all own both of them. They're both 
great guitars. Just a very unique, very recognizable sound and tone that the hummingbird has. You can hear it and you can compare it to 50 to 100 different guitars and you can recognize, is that a hummingbird? You really hear the difference. I love the guitar. I think it's fantastic. And in terms of owning a hummingbird, Gibson versus Epiphone, the way that I would look at it would be something like this. If you've got a ton of money and money's not a concern to you, of course. When it comes to something like the Hummingbird or the Dove or the J200 or the J45, all classic Gibson guitars, then buy a Gibson. You've got pl plenty of money. Why not? But if money's a little tight, but you still want to own one of these guitars. Bear in mind, Gibson owns Epiphone. They outsource the making of these guitars, usually to an Asian country, so they're more affordable. The guitar is com composed primarily of the same ingredients, sounds pretty much the same. Maybe there's slight differences. I've seen a lot of blind uh, challenges and about 50% of the time people can tell the difference and 50% of the time people can't tell the difference. I've even seen guys say that one sounds better, right? When they're blindfolded and they take the blindfold off and it's an Epiphone instead of a Gibson. But, you know, if it's a money thing, just get the Epiphone, right? Now, of course, like I said, Epiphone also makes some great guitars of its own, has its own guitars and models and lines, and some of those are absolutely fantastic. And in those cases, you're not making a choice because Gibson doesn't make them. For example, we'll do an episode on the Epiphone Excellente because that thing deserves it. It's just one of the most beautiful guitars I've ever heard. And that's that's a situation where you don't have to make a choice. It's just, it's the Epiphone Excelente. It's like the frontier. You want to own those guitars. They're, they're beautiful. So let's just uh, mess around a little bit. Let's say hello and goodbye for now to the Hummingbird. Absolutely beautiful to look at. Beautiful aesthetics with a damn good sound too.